Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you've been faithful and that you have favored us in the months of this study, bringing us through so much, uh, giving us time and opportunity either week to week from the beginning as some have been here from that day uh, or otherwise, Father, through the, the opportunity to study up on recorded lessons. We thank you for that gift as well. But in both cases, Father, we acknowledge your faithfulness to us. We praise your name and your power, your strength in preserving your word so that here on this day we could study it. I thank you, Father, for the technology that's continuing to allow us to put this word into the hearts of those who are desiring to know the truth. Father, tonight as we've gathered wherever we are, around the world, in our homes, driving in our vehicles, sitting at uh, a coffee shop, whatever we might be doing right now, Father, we ask that you would uh, open our hearts to what we'll learn tonight and show us, Father, how these events make a difference in our life, even now how we can be prepared as a believer to share this truth with others so that we can direct them into the mysteries of what the future might hold. And Father, we pray that what we do with it, however you direct, would glorify your name. For that is the purpose we have in serving you, Father. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for joining me again and welcome to Lesson 20E of our Revelation study. Tonight we're going to finish the study of our kingdom period, as I said. We're going to be examining events that end the thousand-year period uh, of the kingdom on earth. And, and in all the times we've studied this now for the last four weeks, we've covered basically four broad areas. Let me just review those with you very quickly. We've studied the order of creation and nature and geography and the borders of Israel and so on. Uh, we've studied the daily life of the kingdom, including how death has a part in those thousand years. Last week, we did that walk through the temple, the kingdom temple that will exist on Mount Zion for the thousand years. We looked at the, the worship system of that temple and sacrifice and so on. And then this week, the final week of our four weeks looking at the kingdom, we're going to be looking at the final war of human history, the war of Gog and Magog, which takes us back to chapter 20 of Revelation. Now before we go to the book of Revelation, I want us to review a timeline for just a moment. It'll be helpful for us to understand what we're going to be learning tonight, to remember the timeline of events in the book of Revelation as they apply to the end where we are now. We've read already in Revelation 20 verse 6 that the time of Christ's ruling in this kingdom period will last for a thousand years. Remember that's the one key detail that Revelation gives us about the kingdom. It tells us how long the kingdom will be, 1,000 years. And that's the period of history we've been studying now for the last three weeks and again tonight. Now before we uh, studied that period or got into this study of that period of the 1,000 years, do you remember we also studied that brief period that preceded the kingdom but followed the tribulation. That was that 75-day interval that Daniel chapter 12 told us would exist, this little period of time that's sandwiched between Christ's second coming at the end of tribulation and the inauguration of the thousand years. If you want to think of it this way, imagine a clock that's counting down a thousand years and God has his hands on the starter and he doesn't start it when Jesus comes back to the earth. He waits 75 days, then the clock starts. And from that moment, you have a thousand years, the Bible says. Now I'm reminding you of this detail because the fact that there is this little extra time stuck in between two larger periods, the fact that that happened at the beginning of the thousand years set a precedent, which you're going to see tonight, returns again at the end of the thousand years. The precedent is this. Just as we did not start counting the thousand years until that 75 days was over, well, neither will we stop counting or uh, Neither will the next age start until there's been another interim of time. And I want to show you that in chapter 20, where we go tonight, starting in verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. All right, this is the next section of our study 
in Revelation 20. You notice 20 verse 7 opens with, when the thousand years are completed. So notice that. By the time we get to the events of verse 7 and onward, the events I just read about, these final events, did you notice that we've already run out the clock on the thousand years? So in our timeline again, what we're learning is that there is a period of time following the thousand years. That's what starts in verse seven. And what happens in verse seven and onward fits into a little gap that comes after the thousand years. In fact, that gap, as we're gonna learn in the next part of the study tonight, is seven years and maybe a little longer. Seven years and perhaps a few more days beyond that. So if you wanted to measure the entire time between Christ's second coming and the new heavens and new earth, which follows the kingdom, you'd have to add the 75 days at the beginning, the thousand years of the kingdom, and now seven, maybe a little longer than seven years at the end. So roughly a total of 1,007 years for this entire period. Now we're gonna learn about those seven years tonight, but first, why is this detail so important? Well, it's going to help you understand the purpose of that thousand year kingdom. One of the questions we've already received, and I'm sure it's on the minds of many, is why is there a thousand year millennial kingdom only to give way to something else later? Why that period of history? Why does it exist? Well, the kingdom serves a specific purpose, which is understood by understanding how it's separated from the war of Gog and Magog. Because chapter seven, or chapter 20 of Revelation seven, said that this war that's instigated by Satan doesn't even start until the thousand years is complete. That separation between the thousand years and the war will help us understand why the thousand years exists. But we're gonna get there in stages tonight. We're gonna study this war, the war of Gog and Magog, as you saw in Revelation 20, verse eight. And as we study this little period that encompasses the war, we're going to go outside the book of Revelation again, because as I've been saying, the book of Revelation tells us virtually nothing about the events of the kingdom and around it. Just little hints like what we read tonight. The detail comes out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. Before we go there, let's start by understanding how the war gets started. And that explanation came at the beginning of verse of the second half, rather, of verse seven in Revelation 20. In the second half of that verse, we learn that the culminating events of the kingdom will end with Satan being released from the imprisonment that he's had for those thousand years in the abyss. And you remember at the beginning of that thousand years when we were studying at the beginning of chapter 20, end of 19, beginning of 20, we learned then that Satan would be bound at Christ's second coming and he would be committed to this prison, I guess you'd call it, in the heart of the earth for the length of the 1,000 years. I'll remind you where we read that, chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a 1,000 years. Now, you notice John says in verse 2, Satan spends a 1,000 years in this prison. That's confirmation of what I just told you a moment ago. The full and complete thousand year kingdom goes on without Satan ever being loose during that full thousand years and that's why the war does not start until the thousand years is over. But once he's released, notice he immediately begins to deceive humanity from chapter 20 we read earlier, leading to a war on earth and that is the first time earth has seen war since the tribulation. That war is going to involve a countless number of people. It's like the sands of the seashore, we were told. And their target for this battle is Israel, and specifically the temple in Jerusalem. We'll come to that more in a minute. Notice in Revelation 20, where I was reading earlier, it says they come up to, they come up to the broad plain and they surround the beloved city, which is, of course, Jerusalem, Uh, You remember we studied earlier in Zechariah about some of the topography of the kingdom, and one of the things Zechariah told us was that all around Mount Zion, all around Jerusalem in this day, will be a broad plain, which is not the case today. In in today's uh, Israel, there's the foothills leading up to the mountain of Israel, uh, I mean the mountain that the temple sits on. Those foothills are called the Shephelah. But in this day, the Shephelah is gone. It's a broad plain. In fact, if we... uh, Read in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, it says, In that day the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. 
and notice, and the land will be changed into a plain, that's the broad plain that we're talking about, from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site, and on it it goes. So imagine a very flat area with one very prominent peak in the middle of it. That's what the topography will look like. And here you see, if you can imagine in your mind's eye, the war of Gog and Magog consisting of an uncountable number of people, like like water running in toward the mountain from all directions on this broad plain. So many people you can't count them all. That's how the war will be uh, fought, or that's how the battle will take place. And then in chapter 20, verse 9, John told us that the battle ends quite anticlimactically. Uh, The Lord simply comes down from heaven with fire and consumes the invaders in a moment. Not much of a battle. And that's how the final war of the age will end. But that short description in the book of Revelation just raises more questions than it answers. And it's because, once more, Revelation just skimmed over it all. It just gave us the details in a summary fashion because all of the content around it, all the depth of it, all the details of it are provided elsewhere in the Bible. So let's list some questions that we need to answer from what little we've studied so far, and then we'll go find the answers in Ezekiel. Here are the questions we're going to answer tonight. First, why is Satan bound only to be released again later? I'm sure you've wondered that. Most people have. Secondly, why didn't he just, God just destroy Satan in the first place or put him in the lake of fire on day one like he did the Antichrist and the false prophet? Why hold on to him for a thousand years? And then finally, with respect to the war itself, who are Gog and Magog? And what do we learn about the details of this war? What really happened? Why did they choose to fight? Why did they think they could win? You know, there's a lot of things there we'd like to know. So let's get into all of that. We're going to start with that first question. Why was Satan bound in the first place? And... To understand that, you have to have an understanding of Satan's role today. That is, what is his job, if you will? What is his place in the creation today? The Bible says Satan is primarily the one who instigates or provokes sin. He is called the great deceiver, the author of lies. And he provokes sin in two principal ways, according to Scripture. First, it's through deception, through lying, as I just said. You know, in contrast to Jesus, who the Bible calls the truth, we know that the Bible says all truth came from God and originates from Jesus. God cannot lie, the Bible says. So God is all truth and all knowledge. And yet we have a world, today anyway, that's filled with lies. Where's all those lies coming from? It's not coming from God. So where are they coming from? Well, the Bible says that all those lies find their origin in Satan and his demons. So Jesus said, in fact, at one point in John's gospel, that uh, Satan is the father of lies and has been from the beginning, referring back to the garden with Adam and woman. And you could say it this way, if Satan had never existed, the world would know nothing but truth. There'd be no lies. Lies exist because Satan started them. He is the author of all false knowledge on earth. And he's used those lies over the millennia to trick the world, to deceive the world concerning God concerning what is sin and what is obedience. As we have read earlier in Revelation 12, back when Satan was being cast out of heaven, we read this, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives, notice that, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So the enemy works to provoke sin by deceiving the world in such a way that we act in things that are sinful, doing things we shouldn't do, because in some way what Satan has told us through whatever mechanism of the world has convinced us it's okay. It's not so bad after all. Uh, God doesn't mind. He'll, He'll forgive us in the end or something of that sort. That's the first way in which Satan provokes sin, through deception. The second way he provokes sin, according to the Bible, is by tempting our flesh to act according to its desire. You know, our flesh nature the thing we were given from Adam, that we're born into naturally, that nature is already predisposed to act against the word of God, to sin. In other words, Paul says it very simply in one verse in Romans 7. He says in 7.18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh, he says, for the willing is present in me, that is, he has a will within him to do what's right because he's been born again. But he says the doing of good is not. 
because his flesh intervenes. Time and time again, our fleshly nature gets in the way of obedience and pulls us into things that we shouldn't do, even as our spirit knows better. Our physical body has its own desires, and Satan and his demons are experts at enticing your flesh to fulfill its desires. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that we all have this common experience of being tempted by our enemy, who Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, is the tempter, the great tempter. But in that same verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul goes on to say that even though we all have this common experience of being tempted, he says that the Lord always provides a way of escape for those who are being tempted. It's just up to us to take that option. I I compare it to being on a freeway, barreling down the road in the wrong direction, and you pass an exit ramp. Well, if you take the exit ramp, you're going to solve your problem. If you don't take the exit ramp, well, it did you no good. And that's, in a sense, how the Lord works in helping us through moments of temptation. There's always an exit. There's always a way out in our immediate moment if we just look for it, something that will help us through the temptation. But that's the enemy's tactic, deceive you and tempt you. So you've always heard people say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, now you know that's a lie, too. It's not true. It's an excuse. The enemy may deceive you at times, but we have the word of God available to us to correct those deceptions if we turn to it. And he will certainly tempt us at times to sin, but the Lord has given us his spirit to teach us and lead us into righteousness. And if we listen to it instead of him, instead of listening to Satan, we'll avoid the temptation. So there's always been options. At the end of the day, the devil and his demons don't make you sin. Your choice to sin is your own, either out of ignorance or out of lust, But at the end of the day, it's your choice. But he is a powerful catalyst to provoke those sinful choices in us. And as we studied in prior weeks, when we get into the kingdom, Jesus is going to rule this period of history with, according to Psalms, a rod of iron, which is a way of saying he will enforce righteousness perfectly without variation or delay. If Satan had been loose in the world during these thousand years, deceiving the world, tempting the world to sin. Of course, now those tactics are only directed at the natural people of the kingdom, not at those who are glorified like we will be because we will no longer have a nature that can be tempted. We'll be like the angels. We'll be like Jesus in that respect. But the world will be populated by a lot of natural people as we studied already, and they will have all the same tendencies we do now, including a tendency to be tempted or to be deceived. And if Jesus allowed Satan loose in the kingdom period to do what he does, then it would undermine Jesus' perfect rule in that period of history. So for a thousand years, to ensure there is no opportunity for sin to gain a foothold, the enemy will be bound and out of the way. Now to be sure, there still will be sin in the world because the world is filled with people who possess a sinful nature. But Because those people will be living under the watchful eye of a perfect and just king who has the power to limit the impact of sin and judge it instantly and judge it perfectly, the fact that sin exists will not lead to a rampant expression of sin in the world. Christ will be that governor to prevent its rise. But if Satan had been present, there would have been an equal force, not equal, probably the wrong term, right? But an opposite, that's the right word, an opposite force pushing people towards sin, and that would have compromised Jesus' purpose in the kingdom. So scripture says that there'll be no catalyst, that there'll be nothing to disturb the peace during the time of the kingdom. And because we assume the demons do the same thing Satan does, that after all, they're, they're on his team, it Even though the Bible doesn't say what happens to them, I assume they are also bound for a thousand years. I'm not sure if they they weren't bound. I'm not sure why they wouldn't be doing all the same things anyway. So it would appear as though when Satan is bound, the leader, you know, the head of the snake is put in the prison. The rest of it is there with him. That's the assumption. So we understand now why Satan is being bound for a thousand years. That is, it's simply so that he's not there to wreak havoc in the kingdom. That's not hard to understand. But it leads us to our next question. Why then is he ever released into the time of the kingdom? Well, Paul gives us that answer in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a bit complicated, but we'll take our time and you'll see it at the end. And interestingly, what we're going to learn in 1 Corinthians 15 is actually connected to our first question. That is, why was he bound? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 24. Paul, speaking about 
eschatology, about how the world will end. He says, then comes the end, and I'm going to... I'm going to use proper names here in place of the pronouns just to make it simpler. Then it comes the end when Jesus hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when the God and Father has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For Jesus must reign until the Father has put all of Jesus' enemies under Jesus' feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For The Father has put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. But when the Spirit says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that the Father is accepted who puts all things in subjection to Jesus. When all things are subjected to Jesus, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the One, the Father, who subjected all things to Jesus so that God may be all in all. Now if you want a complete exposition of this passage please go to our first corinthians study online but for our purposes tonight here's the key things you need to know paul in quoting here from psalms 8 reminds us that the father promised that eventually all enemies of god in all creation would become subject to jesus's authority that's pictured by jesus having them under his feet that is he will control crush destroy put down all rebellion every enemy of god will be subjected to Christ's authority before the world ends. That is, think of it this way. The purpose of the creation itself, the purpose of the world itself, is to see everything that opposes God put under Christ's authority. Death will be the final enemy that is abolished, Paul says. Now, death is not a person. It's a state of being. So, in this context, death personifies Satan. Remember, Satan is the author of death. In his own sin, he brought death into existence, sin into existence, and through his influence on the garden, he brought it into the life of man and woman. So, in a sense, you could say death is Satan. He's the poster child, if you will, for death. Once Satan is defeated, then, being the last enemy, then we will have reached the point where all things are under Christ's rule. And Paul says, as soon as the purpose in the creation is met, in that regard. Once that mission has been accomplished, uh, think of it like this. They, they're in heaven, Father and Jesus, and they're looking at earth and they're saying, okay, uh, do we have any enemies left? Nope, Father, uh, just got rid of Satan. Okay, check, all enemies done. Any more reason to rule? Don't see any. No more people to rule, no more enemies to rule. We've done it all. Okay, world's over. Click. That's what Paul's saying. That when the final enemy is abolished, the purpose of rule itself goes away. Remember, we said this at an earlier point in our study. The whole concept of ruling presumes something needing rule, something that is not already ruling itself properly. In other words, it needs sin. If you have a 100% sinless world, you need no ruling. Everyone's going to do the right thing all the time. So this promise in Psalm 8 from the Father is this. Until we get this world free of all opposition, this world will stick around. But the moment... The last enemy has been placed under Christ's authority. Then this world is done. And you notice all authority at that point is abolished. There's no need for it. So even Christ himself exercising authority as the son of God and as the king of the world, even that role is no longer needed. I'm speaking specifically about his ruling, not about his person in the Godhead, but the fact that he is exercising rule on the earth while the Father is in heaven that distinction is no longer needed. And at that point it says, he hands back all authority to the Father and God may be all in all. We'll study more about that when we look at the new heavens and new earth. What we're learning is this. The purpose of the kingdom itself, the reason you have a thousand year kingdom on earth, is for the purpose of giving Jesus that promised opportunity to rule over all his enemies. And according to the chronology of the Bible, as best we can measure it, the world has existed in its present form for about 6,000 years, maybe a little less. And during those 6,000 or so years, history is a testimony to the failure of humanity to run this place. Uh, The world itself is under the dominion of Satan, or has been until Christ returns, and sinful humanity has been trying its best to rule itself ever since the fall. And we've been doing a pretty miserable job of it. 
The world is filled with death and war and misery and destruction and selfishness and you name it. It's a disaster. So 6,000 years of human history simply proves we cannot rule our own hearts, much less a world of other people. And the Lord said that as much in his word in Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert. He will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. And then it adds, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? So simply put, if we trust in our own strength, our own intelligence, our own ingenuity, uh, you know, in the middle of a disaster, we tell each other, we'll work our way out of this. Well, good luck with that because the Bible says if you trust in mankind, he says you're going to be cursed in the end because people are going to let you down consistently. But if you let the Lord rule in your heart and when he comes to rule in the world, well, then you're going to see what it means to have perfect, righteous rule. And those who look to that authority are blessed. So for 6,000 years, the world has trusted in mankind and not coincidentally, the number six is also the number of sinful fallen man. And when you take the additional thousand years that we're going to have in the kingdom and add it to the 6,000 or so years that we're going to experience before that, you end up with a number that we all know really well, seven. And it's my conjecture that the reason there is 6,000 prior to the 1,000 is so that God can make a point through all of this uh, numerology. 6,000 years is proof of sinful man's corrupt nature and uh, incapacity to rule himself properly. And then another 1,000 years of Jesus ruling in perfection, put the two together, you got seven. You got the completed work of God in this creation. So the purpose of the kingdom, fundamentally, is to be the capstone period of history for the earth's existence, and its purpose is to demonstrate what perfect rule looks like, in contrast to what we've been doing for 6,000 years. And Satan will be bound during those 1,000 years so that he will not get in the way of that perfection that Jesus is here to establish over creation. But when those 1,000 years is complete, God needs to end this phase of time He needs to put the earth to its end. Remember, Paul said, what will bring the earth to an end? When the last enemy is subjected to Christ. And so, Satan is released for a little while. He is released so that this age can come to its completed end. Jesus crushes Satan's final rebellion, and then, having done so, as I said earlier, he has checked the last box. He's abolished the last enemy, and as a result, at that point, creation can be put to end because it's met its purpose. So now you know why he was bound, to make possible a thousand years of perfection, and now you know why he has to be set free to deceive the nations, so that the creation itself can come to completion and Christ can defeat the last enemy. Think about this, if Satan had been destroyed at the outset of the kingdom, at the same time as the false prophet and the antichrist, then we could never have had a kingdom, because at the moment he would have destroyed Satan. Think about how the world was constituted at that point. All unbelievers were dead at the beginning of the kingdom and all those who were fighting with the Antichrist died at the second coming of Christ. The false prophet and the Antichrist are in the lake of fire. There was only one enemy still remaining at the start of the kingdom and that was Satan. By leaving him alive but bound, we have the opportunity for a thousand years. Had he been destroyed on that day, well then, as Paul said, the creation would have been finished. There'd have been no point anymore in having a kingdom all enemies would have been abolished. So God actually allows Satan to stick around in that confined space to give us the thousand-year kingdom, to let us experience what life here on earth with a perfect ruling king is going to be like. Now that leads us into the last events of this book, into the final judgment, the new heavens and new earth. That's what follows in Revelation 20 at this point and into chapters 21 and 22. But we're not going to go there tonight because we still have that third question that we wanted to answer. We've explained why Satan was bound, why he was released, why he wasn't destroyed in the beginning, but we still need to answer the question of who are Gog, who are Magog, what what are the details of this battle, and how did they deceive the world, and so on. Well, as I said, Revelation doesn't tell us all this, but uh, those details are elsewhere. 
And interestingly, there are only two mentions of Gog and Magog in the context of war in the Bible. Only two places, Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 38 and 39. That's usually a pretty good sign that you're looking at the same event. And we're going to go look at chapter 38 and 39 tonight only in a summary fashion. I mentioned last week that we have a full Bible teaching on the book of Ezekiel. And that's where you'll get the full story if you want more. For our purposes tonight with the half hour or so that we have remaining, we're just going to skim through the key points of that battle as explained in that book of Scripture. Starting with a simple framework for understanding the purpose of these chapters. And by framework, I mean there is some background you'll need to understand why these two chapters are in the book of Ezekiel in the first place. Let's just start with a few minutes of overview on the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a book of prophecy. It's a long book. It's got 48 chapters. And the last 16 of those 48, so if you're counting chapter numbers, it's chapters 33 through 48, those chapters are all devoted to prophecies related to the kingdom. Think about that. That's a lot of text, a lot of chapters devoted to the kingdom. We've already studied some of this last week. If you remember when we looked at the temple and we took our tour of the temple, that's chapters 40 through 48 of the book of Ezekiel. Now, obviously, we didn't study all those chapters, but we hopped around in there to see what we needed to see. And also in Ezekiel is the story of the Gog and Magog War. That war is taught in the two chapters right before the temple and the kingdom time. That's in chapters 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. Now, for perhaps that reason, the fact that 38 and 39 come before uh, uh, Ezekiel's description of the kingdom, for that reason, some scholars have chosen to view the events of that war, the war of Gog and Magog, as taking place before the tribulation, before the kingdom and even before the tribulation, in our day today, there are some that would tell you that that war could take place today in in our current world. But as you take a closer look at the discussion of those events in Ezekiel and compare it to what we know in chapter 20 of Revelation, I think you find a different story. It is not the case that the chapters of Ezekiel are organized chronologically. They are actually organized according to God's promises to Abraham because The entire kingdom is a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant covenant given to Israel. I'm going to jump here to, here we go, to the Abrahamic covenant. You may know that in chapter, well, it came in three or four different chapters of Genesis, but in various places in Genesis, God promised Abraham that he would give him a series of things, give to Abraham and to his descendants. And we can summarize the relationship between those promises given to Abraham and the chapters of Ezekiel with a simple chart. Let's start with just looking at what's in the promises themselves. There are four parts, broadly speaking, to Abraham's promises. First, he was going to get an inheritance of land in the land of Canaan, and that land would come with great prosperity, flowing with milk and honey. Secondly, he'd have many descendants, even though he didn't have any children at the time, God said, never mind, you're going to have a lot eventually. They're going to have this long line of descendants, and they're going to live in that land with you, and they're going to live there securely and in peace. Third, he says, I'm going to live there with you. God's presence will be with you in the land, among the people. And then later in the Bible, when David came along, God added another element to this promise. We call it the Davidic covenant but it's an extension of what God promised Abraham. He said, I'm also going to put an eternal king in that land, and that eternal king is going to rule with perfect justice. You take all four of those things together, you have basically what God has promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants. We call it the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. Now, if I take those four elements of promise and compare them to those 16 chapters of Ezekiel that describe the kingdom, you find that they're organized perfectly in keeping with those four promises. In other words, those chapters all describe different, uh, different ones of those four promises being fulfilled. God showing himself to be faithful to Abraham in what, in what he said he was going to give Abraham throughout the whole of the kingdom period. And it has a nice symmetry to it. It's divided into pairs, couples of, of chapters. Again, things we don't need to know about tonight. But the thing you need to know tonight is two of those chapters deal with two promises related to to the Abrahamic covenant. Specifically, God fulfills his promise to ensure Israel's security in the land and 
he fulfills his promise to show his glory in that time to the nations of the world. He fulfills those two promises through the events of chapters 38 and 39. Again, go back and listen if you want more detail, but let's take that and go forward for tonight. We're going to start in chapter 38 of Ezekiel. This is the chapter that looks at how God is fulfilling his promise to keep Israel secure and safe in the land that he gives them. And Ezekiel 38, 1 starts this way. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you about, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out, and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wearing swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth, Togomah from the remotest parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. Be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies, that, you are, that are assembled about you and be uh, on guard or be a guard for them. After many days, you will be summoned. In the latter years, you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, but its people were brought out from the nations and they are living securely, all of them. So that's where the war of Gog and Magog starts in the book of Ezekiel. Our first actor in this drama is Gog. Notice he's from the land of Magog. Let me go back so you can see. And so now we know that Magog's not a person. Gog is the person. Magog is the nation that he comes from. And it actually isn't a name either. Gog is a title, more like Caesar or Pharaoh. So this is some kind of man who's taken the title of Gog, and he is from Magog. And if you look at the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, it tells us where everybody went after the ark landed. In that chapter, we learn that Magog is a place in the world roughly comparable to Eastern Europe, including Turkey. And among the grandsons of Noah, who went to that region, are those who include Magog, Meshach, and Tubal. That's where those names come from. So a man with the title Gog comes out of somewhere in roughly Eastern Europe to Turkey, And this man will be joined by allies from the east and from the south, and they will start a war. And notice they come to invade Israel from virtually every possible direction. The only direction they don't come from is the west because that's the sea. So on land, they come from every possible direction. And in verse uh, verse 4, rather, God draws them into battle. And notice he says it's like he puts a hook in their jaw and pulls them in, metaphorically speaking. Now we know from Revelation 20 how God actually does it. He doesn't use an actual hook. He simply lets Satan loose. And Satan does what Satan does. And as a result of Satan being let loose, he becomes the instrument of God to bring Gog into this battle. Next, notice the army is equipped in a very rudimentary way. If we go to the next part of the passage I read to you, um, and actually, no, it's in the first part, back to where we were. You notice it ha- he has horses, uh, shields, swords, things like that. Now, you, you know, if you think about modern warfare today, no one would fight a battle with you know, horses or shields and the like. And we know this is not an event that took place in our distant past when that was the kind of warfare that, predominant, that was predominant. So if it's going to happen at all, it has to happen under some very different circumstances than today, a time in which these elements are back in vogue. And in fact, when you go to chapter 29 of Ezekiel, you find out that all of these things, shields, bows, helmets, all of them are made of wood. They're all made of wood. We're talking about so rudimentary, they don't even have metallurgy to make metal implements. That's how rudimentary this is. That comes to bear later in our our study tonight, just in a few moments. Also, remember from our prior weeks here, we studied how Isaiah foretold that in the kingdom that because of the peace of the kingdom the the art of war would be lost people would forget about it they they wouldn't know how to do war anymore and he says that what was previously a sword would be refashioned into something for farming uh, a pruning hook or something and so the point is there'll be no need for war implements no need for war training no one will even remember how it's done 
After a thousand years, it's a complete mystery to people how you wage war. And then finally, notice that the attack will come across a land, into a land rather, into Israel, that has been restored, it says, from the sword. And what that means is they've put the sword away. They have turned away from the sword. In other words, Israel is defenseless because they don't have a military. That's what it's saying, that military weaponry is obviously not needed in a time of peace, and so they have been restored from the need to have a sword. Now, there are a few other key details here that tell us when this happened. Notice it happens in the latter days. Well, that would be a a, a way of referencing the end of the age. Notice also when they have been summoned by God back into their land from among the nations. That's speaking about Israel being regathered into her land. Notice they live peacefully in this land. And notice at the end of verse 8, in what I read, it says, notice it says, how many of Israel will be in the land? All of them. Not some, all. All Jews on the earth will be in their land. That certainly hasn't happened, and we know from the scriptures it won't happen until after the second coming of Christ. These are key details that all point us in the same direction, each and every one of them. Israel in a state that does not exist today, in a place consistent with the kingdom. So Israel dwelling in its place peacefully without any defenses or need for defenses, having been gathered from all nations and so on, is Israel in the kingdom. By the way, that's just scratching the surface of all the reasons. There's a lot more we just aren't getting into tonight. Now, if you've studied Ezekiel's war before, or if you're a a student of prophecy generally, then I'm guessing that you've probably heard at some point people teaching that the war of Gog and Magog, the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, takes place in our age now, before the tribulation. Russia and Iran will invade Israel for the oil or for the natural gas or some other theory. And then in the middle of that invasion, God will show up and supernaturally defend Israel. It's common to hear this, but the problem is it doesn't fit any of the facts. In fact, I I would venture to guess that if I had never told you that that theory ever existed, it would never come to your mind from what you read in the pages of Scripture. It is, uh, I think, an interesting theory that has somehow taken hold without anything to support it by and large. And as we continue our study, you're going to see the evidence stacking up against it repeatedly. By the way, it's worth noting, as I said earlier, only two places in the Bible that the war of Gog and Magog are mentioned. Revelation 20, which is clearly at the end of the kingdom, and here in Ezekiel. And as a general rule of scripture, you would not expect those two references to be different if all the facts align and if they're the only two in the Bible. That connection, I think, is reason enough. Meanwhile, Uh, John mentions, by the way, I should add one more detail. John mentions the name Gog in Revelation 20 with no explanation, right? He doesn't say anything about who he is or where he's from. He gives no background. That's another sign that the writer expected us to go elsewhere to learn the details. As in, go back to Ezekiel, you'll learn about him. So I think that's another argument. Anyway, let's move on with the invasion. Chapter 38, verse 9. He says, to Gog, God says, you will go up, you will come like a storm, You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil plan and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go up against those who are at rest that live securely, all of them living without walls, having no bars or gates, to capture spoil and seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now in inhabited and against the people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired cattle and goods and who live at the center of the world Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages will say to you have you come to capture spoil have have you assembled your company to uh, seize plunder to carry away silver and gold to take away cattle and goods to capture great spoil therefore prophesy son of man and say to Gog thus says the Lord God On that day when my people Israel are living securely, will you not know it? You will come from your place out of the remote parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly and a mighty army. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land so that the nation, notice this, so that the nations may know me when I am sanctified through you before their eyes, O Gog. So in verse 9, going to the top of that, In verse 9, we read about the moment, or the movement rather, of this vast army of people. Let's go back up to 9. There we go. There's this vast movement of people. 
that are so great they're like a cloud on the earth. Do you remember what we read in chapter 20 of Revelation tonight? They would be like the sand of the seashore, remember? That matches. Then notice verse 10. We see how the invasion unfolds, starting with evil plans, evil plans that are devised in the mind of this man, Gog. He devises a plan to invade Israel, and his idea comes from basically two directions, opportunity and greed. He notices first the opportunity. The land's at rest. He says, it's quiet. It's unsuspecting. It's unwalled. No bars, no gates. I mean, the gates and bars and walls are the most basic of protective measures to stop an enemy attack, right? So if you have an unwalled nation, that indicates a total lack of concern for any threat whatsoever. It would be like you living in your house absent a front door. You have absolutely no reason to think someone's gonna walk into your house, so why bother with a front door? That's the state of Israel at the time of this invasion. That's hardly the state of Israel today, I might add. In fact, if there is one nation on earth famous for walls, it's probably China, number one, and Israel, number two. And I guess the U.S. is trying to catch up. But the point is, you would never call Israel today an unwalled nation. That's ridiculous. And yet it will be in the day of this attack. Secondly, Gog's greed gives him the motivation. His opportunity is that he sees no defenses, and his motivation is he sees a plunder, a booty that he can seize and make his own. He says in verse 12, there is a great abundance in the land, the cattle and the goods and the land and so on. And the Bible has already told us that what Israel will have in the kingdom in terms of these things is second to none. They will be the most blessed nation on earth in that day. So in the kingdom, it's entirely reasonable to believe that some evil man would look at what God blesses Israel with in comparison to what's available elsewhere, and he would see it as an opportunity, and his greed would want for it. Now, flip that around for a moment. Would this be likely in our day today? Would the nations of Iran or Russia or anywhere north of Israel, for that matter, even Turkey, would any of them look at Israel right now and say, man, they've got stuff we don't have. It's worth an invasion. It's worth risking other nations fighting back against us. It's worth nuclear war, because after all, Israel more than likely has nuclear weapons. Do you think there's anything in Israel they want that badly? Nothing I can think of. I mean, Israel's prosperous, yes, but not so prosperous today that there's any motivation at all for that kind of risk. But in the kingdom, absolutely, it would make sense. And notice Ezekiel says these thoughts enter into Gog's mind, but again, we know where the thoughts are coming from, Satan, Satan is the one deceiving him concerning the opportunity. I mean, the lack of walls is not the biggest concern when you're calculating whether you should invade the Israel that has Jesus living in the temple. It's not the walls you should be worried about. But uh, Satan has deceived the enemy, or deceived Gog. Satan has deceived Gog into thinking that he has an opportunity when he doesn't. And then uh, Satan used his second tactic of provoking lust out of Gog by pointing out to him how nice all the stuff was and got his heart interested in chasing after it. Typical Satan. So in verse 15, Gog recruits others to invade with him and with the help of all those other people like the sand of the seashore, John told us, they invade. Now there's an interesting moment there in verse 13 that might be puzzling to you if you don't think about it from the point of view of someone who's lived for a thousand years without war. Verse 13, we're told that the the neighbors of Israel, these are the nations that neighbor Israel to the north, they're puzzled when they see this invading army uh, uh, amassing on Israel's border and obviously intending to go in there and fight and take things for themselves. And they ask these, I guess, somewhat obvious questions. Are you planning to go in there? Are you planning to go fight Israel? Are you planning to take all their stuff? Why would they even ask such dumb questions? Well, it's because no one's ever seen this before. This is a completely new thing. A thousand years with no war, people who were born and raised in that period of history without ever having experienced warfare, and they're seeing it develop in front of their eyes and they don't even, they're they're trying to understand it. They're trying to make sense of it. That fits this context, doesn't it? It wouldn't fit the context of today. An amassing army on the border of Israel is a pretty obvious sign and no one would ask any dumb questions. But in this day, it's not dumb to ask. Then in verse 14, we hear the Lord's challenge to Gog. Rhetorically, he says to Gog, you think you can come in here and disturb Israel's peace? It's rhetorical because what God is doing for us, the reader, is he's highlighting the fact that this is an attempt by Satan to rob Israel 
of the peace that God guaranteed that they would have during the kingdom. He guaranteed it to Abraham, and he's going to fulfill it. And so he's saying to them, are you think you can come here and rob the peace that I have secured for my people? Now, think about this a little more deeply for a moment. Remember that the kingdom is a time without war for a thousand years. These events happen after the thousand years is complete. So for a thousand years, there's been no war. And as I said earlier, Isaiah tells us in chapter two that we've lost the art of war by that point. He says they'll hammer their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Never again will they even learn war. All right, that's the state of the world for the last thousand years. Generations, born and raised, without experiencing how it's done, ever seeing it done. Technology of, the, of war is gone. Nobody has any you know, weapons of war anymore. And God, in the middle of that time, has promised Israel, no one will ever take your peace. But now that raises a question. How do you know God's keeping his promise? I mean, think about it for a moment. If there's never been a threat to peace during the thousand years, then there's no way for God to demonstrate his faithfulness to keeping the peace. I mean, if God promised, for example, that he would cure you of cancer, but you never actually contracted cancer, can you say that God was faithful to his promise? He didn't say you would never get cancer. He said he would cure you of cancer. In order for that faithfulness to be evident, you'd have to first get the cancer so that then you could see God's faithfulness in curing it. That's the same problem here. God has promised in his word to protect Israel from its enemies. But up to this point, there's been no enemy. There's been no one even trying. So in order to show himself faithful to that promise, God lets the enemy out, knowing what he will do, prompting him through Gog to start a war so that God can show himself faithful to Israel in preventing the war from taking Israel's peace. Now, let's look at the nature of that warfare as we finish tonight in a few more places. We're going to look at verse, back to verse 15. You notice, once more, all of the people are riding on horses again. By the way, the Hebrew word used there for horse is horse. It's not a trick word. It's a horse. They're not, you know, metaphors. They're not symbols. of. It's a horse. They were riding horses, which means this is, again, a rudimentary type of warfare. Um, and... Again, there's a cloud of them. The size of them is uncountable. Let's see what the Lord does in response to this invasion. That's in chapter 39, verse 1. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around and drive you on and take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. I will strike your bow from your left hand and dash your arrows from your right hand. You will fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall on the open field, for it is, as, uh, it, for it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God, and I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. So that's how this, this battle will end. The Lord will thwart the attack. Notice in verse 3, he says, he strikes the bow and arrows from the man's hands. That reminds us of what we learned in chapter 38, that this is, again, rudimentary. Uh, no one knows how to do war except in the basis, the very basic of ways. And at the same time, that's also true for Israel. Israel is completely defenseless. So even though this invading army doesn't have a lot going for it in terms of warfare tools and, you know, implements of war it has a lot of people and a bow and arrow can still hurt you so if God did not defend Israel they're defenseless against all of what's coming at them and so the Lord steps in we're told and defends in Israel against this uncountable army merely on his own power his own might supernaturally notice Israel never engages in any battle at all nothing ever takes their peace before the invading army, army ever reaches an Israeli town of any size or prominence, God has already destroyed them. He strikes them down in Mas with a supernatural event. Now I want you to notice what the event is. He strikes them down, it says, with fire from heaven. I mean, could it get any more uh, specific than that when you have Revelation 20 saying that they are consumed from heaven with fire? The, the two line up perfectly. There is not a single point of departure between what Ezekiel says about this war and what Revelation 20 says. The army of the, of the land of Magog will be completely consumed and die in that moment, and Israel's peace will be intact. There's one more interesting detail to this battle as we finish tonight. 
in chapter 39, verse 9. We read this. Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears, and for seven years they will make fires of them. They will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires from the weapons. And they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. On that day I will give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will block off those who should pass by. So they will bury Gog there with all his horde, and they will call it the valley of Hem and Gog. For seven months the house of Israel will bury them in order to cleanse the land. Even all the peoples of the land will bury them, and it will be to their renown on the day that I glorify myself, declares the Lord God. They will set apart men who will constantly pass through the land, burying those who are passing through, even those left on the surface of the ground, in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search as those who pass through the land. Uh, and anyone, and I'm sorry, as those who pass through the land pass through. And anyone sees a man's bone, then he will set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And even the name of the city will be Hamanah, so they will cleanse the land. It's kind of an interesting detail, isn't it? The Lord has vanquished the invading army uh, and you end up with this wasteland of dead. And all of their wooden tools now become a huge supply of firewood. And so the people of Israel go out and scavenge all of these wood implements and they think, you know, it's a lot easier to pick up this wood than it is to go get a tree out of the forest. And so for seven years, they're able to burn these tools sufficient to fuel fires for whatever they're doing. This is confirmation of a couple things. It's confirmation that the tools are wood. You can't burn a steel sword. So these are obviously wooden implements. But secondly, it also says that the primary fuel for the kingdom is wood, or at least it's a major one. And that suggests, again, a more rudimentary lifestyle. And in verse 10, the Lord says they don't get fire from the forest. They don't have to go out and find other f- sources of fuel. So this, this must have been an incredible quantity of wood telling you how big the army was. Then Gog and all his multitude of army will be buried, which is a very kind thing to do to one who would come into the land. Now they're not, their flesh is not necessarily still there because elsewhere in this chapter we're told that the birds are feasting on it, but the bones of those bodies are going to be buried. And they're buried in the Jordan River Valley. That's the valley inf- that's uh, inferred here by the geographic reference. And the bodies in that area will be so numerous that the ground having so many graves will be blocked from passage. No one will be able to move through the Valley of Jordan anymore because a Jew is not allowed to traverse over graves. And so the number of buried bodies will be that many. And they'll have to rename the valley, Hamangog, which means a multitude or an uproar. So the valley is called the multitude or the uproar of Gog. So that's what God has Israel do. And you notice it takes seven months to finish the burial, and then the burning, we're told, goes on for seven years. That's why we said earlier that this period of history that, ends, uh, that takes place after the thousand years is at least seven years and a little more. So we have a period of history here that's not technically the thousand-year kingdom, but neither is it the new heavens and new earth that we find finishing off this period of human history, the creation itself. One of the strongest arguments people have made for why this event could not be the same event as Revelation 20 is because of this seven-year period. You may have heard people tell you that, well, the war of Gog and Magog can't take place in the kingdom. It lasts seven years, and it can't be, the, you know, the kingdom only lasts a thousand years, so you can't have another seven years. Ah, but you now know why that's no longer a concern, right? They've missed the point. This war happens after the thousand years, so it's not on the clock. The clock's already stopped. Uh, there's no limit on how long this can go on because we're not up against some timetable in Scripture. There's just an unknown period of time here of at least seven years. Lastly, in verse 13, the Lord says, all of this burying activity was done so that Israel would make a name for itself among the nations as having taken care to do the right thing here, even though they were being invaded. It's a testimony. Turning back to the text one last time, there's one more detail to explain why the Lord cleansed the land in this way. In verse 17, As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, 
Speak to every kind of bird and every beast of the field. Assemble, come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them the fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are glutted and drink blood until you are drunk from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. You will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers and mighty men and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. Now that may sound a bit gross, a little difficult to hear, but there's a real important point in all of that. The Lord has told his people, uh, or actually starting with the animals, he's told the animal kingdom, uh, specifically the birds and beasts of the field, I'm preparing a sacrifice for you and you're going to be able to eat your your fill on the number of people who are going to be dead on the field. And they're going to come and feast on these people who have been sacrificed as if they were rams or lambs and so on. Here's what you're learning. Remember, in the beginning of our relationship with God in this sinful world, if you go back to the very beginning, in fact, back to Genesis chapter 3, God taught men, people, humanity, that we have to sacrifice animals in order to be reconciled to God. That's how the, the creation itself got started at the very beginning after the first sin. Now, we're at the very end of this period. We're, we're at the opposite end, just as the Genesis story is at the very beginning of this creation. Well, this moment we're describing now is the very last thing that happens before this earth burns up. And it ends in an opposite way to the way it begins. In the beginning, we sacrificed animals to God. In the end, God sacrifices men to the animals. And that is his way of putting a capstone to the whole of human history. God makes humanity that is the unbelieving, rebellious humanity, a sacrifice to the animals. The animals gain the benefit while man pays the price, God being the one making the sacrifice. The message in that is simple. The need for sacrifice of any kind has come to an end. We started with us sacrificing animals. It ends with animals sacrificing us, so to speak, and in that the circle is complete. The Lord himself conducts the final sacrifice of this period of creation history and the final offering is of those who opposed him and the final act of judgment is to close the age having given opportunity for the Lord to be glorified in that final act Ezekiel 39 21 says I will set my glory among the nations and all the nations will see my judgment which I've executed in my hand which I have laid on them so with that and the events around that war All unbelief in the creation is now gone, dead, and buried, and now to be judged for all eternity. And that's where we go next week. Next week, we will pick up in chapter 20 at the very end with the moment of judgment for all unbelievers who have ever lived, called the Great White Throne Judgment. Along with them, Satan will find his end. And then from there, the earth and its works will be burned up, this creation having met its purpose And then we move into some very new things, literally new things, the new heavens and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22. That's what we start next week. I hope you'll be here to join us for that. I hope you learned something tonight that's useful to you and maybe something that gets your head thinking a little bit. Uh, We're going to go into time of prayer to finish, and then as we do, of course, we'll answer your questions. Let's pray. Dear Father, Father, we we thank you for your marvelous plan. We... um, Thank you that we've been included in your grace. Uh, We thank you, Father, that we get to enjoy a kingdom free from the enemy and his schemes. We thank you, Father, that in that time we can no longer be deceived and we can no longer rebel, and we greatly look forward to that day. And, Father, we, uh, we look forward to the time that we get to escape this world and enter into that world so that we can know what it is truly like to be obedient. But in the meantime, I ask, Father, that our heart's desire would be to seek for that obedience even now, to, to not succumb to the schemes of the enemy as he deceives us or as he tempts us. Help us to know your word well enough to escape those de- deceptions and to discipline our flesh uh, strongly enough that those lusts of life will not intervene. And Father, help us to understand the, the things we've learned tonight according to your Spirit's instruction. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen.